Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He <laughs> is the legendino that's known as Tim Vickery, and he's in Rio de Janeiro. Hello, Tim. Hello, and he is the night owl, the voice of the BBC at any time, any place, anywhere. He'll work uptown nights, he'll work Jewish holidays, he'll do the whole thing. <laughs> Don't add a bow. Yeah, I, I'm cheap. Um, um, <laughs> whether you need me for a birthday, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, you know where to come. Uh, but today, you get your chance to have a good old moan, because you've got something on your chest that's been there for a few months now, I see. Well, it, in some ways, what, what we're talking about now is the birth of what I ludicrously call my career. Because, uh, you know, that, that England 1990 side, the one that uh, so nearly reached the final of the World Cup. I love that team. Uh, and I, was, I was very attached to, 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 to that team. And, uh, oh, no, after the World they're going to give it to Graham. So they're going to give it to Graham. They've given it to Graham Taylor, <laughs> who... Uh, in, retros job. in retrospect, I've come to appreciate a little bit more. I didn't like him at the time. Um, but I remember just being distraught at this. And I had a job where I was working in a, in a, in a theatre in the West End of London. And uh, I had to be there on a Sunday, one Sunday, with absolutely nothing to do. I just had to be there for hours to accept a delivery or something. So I bought all of the Sundays just after he, he, was, he was appointed. And the, it was the first thing that I turned to on all of them. What is the, the, the opinion piece? What's the football writer saying about Graham Taylor? And uh, dear old Brian Glanville, bless him, just criticised the whole thing. You know, he said, uh, uh, England would be better off without any manager at all. That's exactly <laughs> how he spoke, you know. That's yes. exactly how Brian... And still Glenville. does. Yeah, and yeah, still does. Right. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of them, were saying, yes, this is the right man for the job. And I just sat there slumped in my chair thinking, forgive them, oh Lord, they know not what they write. I've got to get into this game. So in, in some ways, it was that that gave me the dynamite up the backside to think, well, yeah, maybe I could do that. You know, If these people really think Graham Taylor is the man to take over the England team, then maybe I, I, I should be there um, uh, um, having, me, having me own or in. I also think, reflecting on this a little bit more, you know, we just did um, Diego Maradona, which was great with Asif Kapadia. It was wonderful. Uh, and um, you put him in a Shakespearean perspective, Maradona. And you used Othello. The, the, my, all that I know about Othello is based on you making a par comparison between the play and Diego Maradona. <laughs> so I thank you for educating me. But the, 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 uh, what you were saying really was, we're dealing with a, a, a great man, an extraordinary man, put in extraordinary circumstances. And those extraordinary circumstances ended up amplifying both his greatness and his defects. And that was the Shakespearean side of Maradona. I actually think there's a Shakespearean side of, of the Graham Taylor story. Maybe perhaps a little bit more King Lear than Othello. Because what you've got with, with Taylor is not a great man in professional capacity a good one he, he, he was no idiot as, as a coach he was put in a situation I think which was probably above his his capabilities but he's he's basically an ordinary kind of guy very engaging guy um, but part of the downfall is the absolute massive ego that he has and that I think is probably the key to why it was such a huge failure. He had ill fortune. There's no doubt about it. He was very unlucky. But he worked very hard to heap ill luck upon himself. And part of that, I think, is an excess of ego, which sometimes I think came out as him being very, very engaging. He just wanted everyone to like him. The dangerous path, wanting everyone to like you sometimes. You know, you've... you've uh, and I think that... That is, there's a Shakespearean tragedy in there of someone not up to the job with a massive ego and it all gets too big for him. Does yeah, sense? yeah, absolutely. And I can, I can see the King Lear in him. I, I would suggest that for me, it's Coriolanus. Now, um, Coriolanus, 
Oh, by the way, before we get into that, I should tell people who are listening for the first time, particularly what we do on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast is try and take a look and analyse a particular match um, of resonance and sometimes a classic football match. Sometimes it's the circumstances around that that make it interesting enough to uh, reflect on. So we take a classic or a memorable football match from sometime in history and we try and analyze the football match, what went right, what went wrong, the players of importance, the coaches, etc. And also try and look at the sort of wider context of the times that that are a changing, as Bob Dylan would say, and um, also through the prism of music, let's not forget that, with a look at the pop charts as well. But why I would say why I would say it was Coriolanus, and not everybody knows. See, I had no idea that Shakespeare co-wrote a play with Barry Cryer. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know Barry Cryer was that old, frankly. What's, what's this one? <laughs> you're, fun. you're on form today. I've got to watch myself because you're on form today. Okay, Coriolanus, which is. Um, it's a true story. There was a Roman general called Coriolanus, and Shakespeare took a lot of his tragedies from um, previous authors of uh, famous, uh, or particularly Plutarch's famous uh, gr uh, Greek and uh, Italian um, famous generals and kings and so on. Um, and Coriolanus, I mean, he has literally lifted Coriolanus straight out of Sir Thomas North's translation of Plutarch, as I recall. If I get that wrong, I'm sure others will tell me. But nevertheless, what I remember is he's literally lifted it, but he's dramatised it and turned it. And this is Shakespeare's skill. He can take the ordinary human story, true human story, and transform it into a memorable tragedy, as he did with Richard III, of course, perhaps most famously. But um, Coriolanus was this... Roman general who had an ego, and it wasn't entirely his fault, his ego. His ego was born out of, um, you know, when you're, you're successful general, everybody's like, praise the, you know, Julius Caesar, praise the, you are like a, a demigod in ancient Greece. Well, Cryolanus's problem, though, was he had to come down from being a demigod to be a patrician. Uh, to be a politician, essentially. And in those days, you had to stand on your soapbox and speak to the common people. And he wouldn't have it. He just wouldn't have it. And I saw, uh, particularly in Graham Taylor's, uh, because there's that famous documentary, Do I Not Like That, mm -hmm. which reveals the, the, the drama, the tragedy, if you like, of Graham Taylor. For those who haven't seen it, it's online. You can watch it. It really is one of the best footballing uh, documentaries I've seen. The most seen. haunting moments. Well, I wake up in the morning with the usual pyjamas all wet through. <laughs> <laughs> you feel sorry for him there. Well, He's out I of depth. I don't think first of all, he's allowed these film cameras to come in and you think to yourself. Ego, those, ego. we'll get there, we'll get there, yeah, but that's course. the ego. Yeah, we'll, we will get there, of course. Anyway, the, the problem with him, when I see Graham Taylor facing the press, the media at the press conferences around uh, England's qualification for the 1994 World Cup, all I can see is Coriolanus because he does not like being there and he talks down to the press the last thing you should be doing this is what Coriolanus is doing in the drama he's talking down to the ordinary people all he's got to do is humble himself he doesn't have to be humble all the time once he gets elected he doesn't have to be humble anymore but he just can't bring himself to do it and that is his downfall in my view so it's September the 13th 1990 October, October the 13th Sorry, October the 13th 1993 is a game that we're looking at in particular. So England have gone through a World Cup campaign. This is perhaps the decisive point, a game against Holland. And we're talking about a Holland team which fields a golden generation of Dutch players. Yeah, although it doesn't defend very well. And the whole, this is the moment... Well, they've got we Ronald Koeman. They don't need to Indeed. defend because he'll take you out. <laughs> um, this is the moment where we fail to qualify for USA 94. But the, the, the Taylor years they, they can be divided be divided into two there's the first two years culminating with a dreadful display in the european championships in 92 the first two years are with lineker and then lineker goes and then you get the second two years when you get the documentary 
I mentioned Lineker because it, it's significant. When he takes over, just after the 1990 World Cup, although most of the press were behind him, he had a big problem, which is that the senior players didn't want him. Huge, that's a huge problem right at the start. He got in Laurie McMenemy as his wise old owl to lean on. And McMenemy thinks the players were out of order. I disagree entirely. Because remember that these players, they've reached that group of players, they've reached the quarterfinals of the 86 World Cup and the semi-final of the 1990 World Cup. Both times losing narrowly to the eventual champions. So that group of players are entitled to feel that they know something about it. And there's a group there that are really not into Taylor. They see him as a, as, as a long ball guy. And he was, had been at Watford. It, it took, he did an unbelievable job at Watford. And he wasn't just long ball. He also, all right, get it forward early. The opposition have a throw on. And then you press them. You press them. He was, he was perhaps out of his time in the way that, his, that he pressed high up in the opposing half. But he ran into problems as soon as the opposition knew how to keep the ball. And then it, then it didn't work. But he did do an excellent job with Aston Villa. In the, the, the late, he, did, he did a really good job with, with, with Villa. He got them back up into the first division, as the Premier League was then. And then last season, before he took the England job, when they got in Paul McGrath from Man United to, to run the defence, and he had David Platt, and he had Gordon Cowans, they nearly won the title. They were, they were, they were fighting with Liverpool for the title. It's the, the best work of his career, I think, at Aston Villa. But he hasn't got the senior players. And Lineker is the leader of this. Uh, I my first big break was, it was only a few years later. It was in '97. I worked with Lineker for two or three weeks. We did a, we did a film shoot, uh, and I obviously I was obsessed with his period. So I asked him, and I, I was I was struck by how much they had become enemies, Lineker and Taylor. They, they really were enemies. Now, because Taylor plays this, I think all wrong. There are really only two options. You've got to win the players over. You've got to persuade them that you're the man for the job. You've got to win them over. You've got to go to them a little bit and, 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 and take them with you. If you can't do that, you've got to resign. Because if you can't do that, you are not the man who is the ideal man to be in charge of these players. Taylor doesn't do either of these things. What he does is he changes the players. They're worried about, because there's the Lineker, Lineker group and they're worried about them seducing David Platt, who'd worked with Taylor successfully at Villa and then had gone to, to Italy and in search of a football education. Uh, and uh, I think Taylor got very defensive about this. So what does he do? He reduces the Lineker group. He drops Chrissy Waddle and Peter Beardsley. It is the worst selection decision I can ever think of because it has three huge effects, three really significant effects. Number one, you cannot replace these two players. It, it, it harms the team. Beardsley was a, and Beardsley, around 93, he's playing, when he goes back to Newcastle, he's playing some of the best football of his career. He's on fire. Mar, uh, Waddle goes to Marseille. And he's exceptional. We were talking with Asif about uh, Marseille wanted to sign Maradona and they couldn't get him, so they signed Waddle. And I tell you, they got more out of Waddle than they would have got out of Maradona at that stage of Maradona's career. He was the best player in Europe for a while, probably. He was, he was, he was, um, it was unbelievable. And Taylor dropped him. So he's harmed his own side, number one. Number two. This is Coriolanus, by the way. This is Coriolanus through and through. Number two. It means that the relationship with Lineker is now beyond salvation. Because... Lineker loves playing with Beardsley and Waddle. Beardsley doesn't go in the penalty area very much. He leaves that space for Lineker to attack. And Waddle is, 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 is uh, Lineker's supply line. So if Taylor doesn't pick him, in, the, in Lineker's mind, and Lineker is the captain, no, this is just unbelievably stupid. So it, it means that, that, that that central relationship for those first two years cannot be salvaged. They are now enemies. And number three... He's got the biggest talent that English football has produced for years is Paul Gascoigne. Now, Gascoigne is a loose cannon. Who keeps him on the rails? 
Beardsley a model. It's the senior Geordies. He's grown up with them. At and Newcastle. Lineker. He, and Lineker, I think, as well. Yeah, but, yeah, but he has Lineker at Tottenham. But he really looks up to Beardsley and, and, and what because they're, they're Geordies like he is, and they kind of keep him in line. They're like his stabilizers. So it's no wonder that, he, that, that Gascoigne's problems get worse when Waddle and, and, and Beardsley are gone. It's, it's just a terrible, terrible selection decision. And here, here is part of the ego. Does he really think that he, Taylor, is more important than the, to the England cause than Waddle and Beardsley? If he really thinks that, he's deluded. He should have resigned. If he can't win them over, resign. I am not the right man to coach these players. So it, that, that condemns the, the first two years to failure. The, the the side that goes to the goes to the European Championships and and which and, and, and which, which sorry to cut you but which England coaches have ever resigned from the job? Kevin um, Keegan. I'm not okay, up to the job. One. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, one. Okay. Um, and that maybe is is if um, for, for different reasons Keegan thought I'm not there tactically. Um, so that that condemns those first two years. Then, Licker goes after Euro 92. Now, Taylor's just got his own, his own men. It's his own group. Now he's, 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 in, he's in charge. What happens now? The documentary. Because it's going to show him. Now, you, you know, why do you agree to something like this? Because, because you think... Well, on, two reasons. Two mm, reasons. Mm. Number one. You think you're going to come well out, out of it? Well, no one's going to agree to an in-your-face documentary if it's going to make you look like an idiot. Number two, he's getting paid. He hasn't discussed this with any of his coaching staff. And he's getting paid for it. Effectively, he's stitching up his mates for his own financial gain, you know, thinking that this thing is, is, is going to leave him looking like a hero. In the end, obviously, it didn't. And he fell out really badly with, with Laurie McMenemy about this, mainly, I think, about the documentary. And just as a, as a, as a, as a, as a post-it to it, at the end, when the, the FA wanted him to resign, uh, Taylor said to the FA, I will only resign if you promise not to give the job to Laurie McMenemy. But he didn't tell McMenemy. McMenemy discovered this years later, reading the, the memoirs of, of, of the FA chief boss, um, uh, Graham Kelly. So uh, the, 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 that's just a disaster of, of, of ego. And you see that so clearly at the end when he lost to Holland uh, and he, he's chatting away to the fourth official and he says, at the end of the day, I get the sack now. And then at the final whistle, he goes to the linesman and he says, uh, um, thank your colleague, meaning the referee. And England have been on the, the, bad, on the wrong end of bad decisions. Um, your colleague now, he's, 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 he's cost me my job. He's got me the sack. Thank him ever so much for that, won't you? It's all me, 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 me. It's not, hang on a minute, we haven't qualified for the World Cup. This generation of players ain't going to the World Cup. It's, I'm getting a sack now. Ego, well, ego, ego. I, I do, I do. Barry Cryer, or whatever you're saying. <laughs> Karai Lamus. <Karai Lamus. laughs> but I, I do get the point that you make there, though, finally, because he should be thanking the referee for disallowing Rijkaard's perfectly <laughs> legitimate goal. That's a good point. To start off with, I mean, Rijkaard was onside, and to miles to, onside. Yeah. Well, exactly to yeah. to requote uh, Stuart Pearce, uh, <laughs> saying <laughs> suggesting that every England supporter knows it was miles offside. Uh, actually, it's the opposite. Yeah. Uh, Rijkaard was miles onside, was. and the referee and the linesman ruled it out. So he should be thanking them for that because otherwise it would have been three nil rather than two nil. Um, arguably, though, it would have been 2 0 nevertheless because um, Ronald Koeman should have been sent off for a, a, a brazen um, a, a foul in a goal scoring opportunity. Uh, it's, a, it's a clear red card and it's a of disgraceful it decision. I, know, I actually I probably don't think it was a penalty. Although, no, it wasn't a penalty, but it was, yeah, still, a, it was still a goal scoring opportunity. Yeah. When those are given as penalties, 
I'm always happy with that because it's kind of a moral penalty, isn't it? You know, if it is given yeah. as a penalty, then, then, uh, but th their one at the other end where Kuman ends up scoring, I think that probably was a penalty. I think that yeah. the contact there was in inside the area. I agree. The, the ref got a few decisions wrong here, but I, I can see that Kuman, well, <laughs> you see, with football, it's all kind of uh, percentages. If Rykart had been given that goal at 1-0, sorry, at 0-0, and it went to 1-0 to Holland, Kuman may not have decided yeah, it's worth yeah, you know, yeah. going for the, you know, fouling. Who was it? The, the, the game, the game, it's David Platt. The game develops in a different in a different way anyway, exactly. isn't it? That, exactly. That's, that, but, that's, that's always the case. But, but looking at the game by itself, um, Holland decided to play with wingers. This is, this is the problem. That's Holland, for, yeah. Yeah, this is a problem, essentially, wasn't it, for um, uh, for Graham Taylor, that he hasn't got any wingers. He, I mean, he's got nobody, he's got no attacking full backs going up the wing. He's got nobody, everybody from England, as I see it, because England are much narrower. Yeah, it's a narrow 4-4-2. Four, four, no, yeah, so no. they're having to go out wide to deal with Overmars on the one hand and Brian Roy on the other hand. And, and that th creates space for Bergkamp to work his of little one-twos down the middle. On Holland, there's no doubt about it. Holland were the better side uh, and were the better and commanded much of that game. But England had chances. And England were, they were hard done by in the game against Wembley as well because England were flying and 2-0 up against Holland. And then right in front of the referee, Valters shatters Gascoigne's jaw with yeah, an elbow. And the referee sees shocking. it and gives that him a yellow shocking. card. That was shocking. And Holland come back and get a 2-2 draw. So that, that they are, there were key decisions that, that, that went against him. Although, as you said, there were some decisions that went in, in England's favour. But on balance, England were, were hard done by, from, uh, by, by the referee. I think in some ways, Taylor is almost like a, a, a kind of proto-Brexit figure. He is a like a little. He's he's a kind of little Englander, you know. He's he, I, I think he was very happy. I don't you know. I don't. Think, I can't imagine him doing any languages or anything. I don't know. He may he may have done, um, but right at the end, the interview that he gives on the on the more or less on the final whistle when he's moaning about the referee with all justification. He's and he's saying the laws of the game were not applied honestly and openly the way that we do it in our country. <laughs> Well, was that after the October 13th game? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I missed that one. Yeah. So, <laughs> so is the, that... the, 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 there is a little kind of, pro, you know, and a, a lot of his values, I think, were, were English hard work and, 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 and determination, um, which uh, at club level had been more than enough for him to have a, a career. But at international level, I think probably intellectually he was out of his depth. OK, and he's certainly out of his depth in terms of tactics, I'd have thought. Um, I thought Dick Advocat uh, was the master tactician in that game. Uh, he had a much more technical side to talk of as well. You know, we mentioned the likes of uh, uh, Dennis Bergkamp, but it seemed like all the, well, with the exception of one or two hard men in the Dutch team, both of them named Koeman, by the way, <laughs> um, it, d it did seem as if, the Dutch players, you know, te um, technical skills for technical skills outclass England, with the exception of maybe Paul Merson, I think he did one or two really mm -hmm. um, clever moves and showed that he had some skills. But like you said, because Graham Taylor had gotten rid of the technical players in the England team previously, um, it just looked as if England played the long ball all the time. And it didn't, didn't seem as if England had football skills to talk of. I mean, we were running, making sort of diagonal runs, particularly David Platt, which I thought were, you know, almost successful. But it was like a game of almost success by luck, almost, you know. England had the more goal-scoring opportunities, arguably, but it was always either they hit the post or they kicked it wide or whatever it was. And it just it just looked as if they were like scrapping, whereas the Dutch team seemed to have a, a sort of a uh, there was this incredible one-two between Dennis Bergkamp and I can't remember who on the other side. I think it's uh, Ronald De Boer maybe through the middle. Yes, that was it. That was it. And I thought that was, you know, that is proper, proper. Yeah. That looked like Man City of today. Yes. Doing, yes you know, and yeah, it just thought, yeah. uh, well, that's 30 years ago and they're outclassing England with every move almost. And and remember that he inherited a team that were a penalty kick away from making the World Cup final. 
And two years later, two years after he'd gone, England were a penalty shooter away from making the final of, of, of Euro 96. Mm. So you, you can't say he had nothing to work with, but he jettisoned some of his best players, which also has an impact on the best one he had, which was, 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 was Gascoigne. Uh, he, he does look like a man who's flailing. My, my, one of my favourite moments from the documentary is just that they've come in from the game away to Poland, where they haven't played very well. A bit lucky to get away with a 1-1 draw. And next up is the Norway game, the one he loses. I actually don't blame him as much as many do for that Norway game. He, he, he experimented with a back three, and he said himself afterwards he didn't have enough time with it on the training ground. But I can see the idea behind it. I can see what he was trying to do. But anyway, he says to the players, they're sitting in the dressing room, and he says, what we've got to do now, we've got to go to Norway and, if possible, win that game. What we don't want to do is lose to them. Is lose to them. He says it twice. You're thinking, all oh, right, these international footballers, they, they, they need to be told that the objective is to win and not to lose. How much are you getting paid for that? It's, you know, you're back with, uh, with, with Plato here, aren't you? A wise man speaks because he has something to say. A fool speaks because he has to say something. You know, if you haven't got anything, anything interesting, interesting to say, keep it shut. I'm so glad that you brought in some philosophy there. And I studied Plato. I can't remember that quote, but I'll take your word for it. It's classic Plato. And if it was, I was Plato... Told it during my school days by a mate well, who was trying to shut me up. Yeah, he did it shut you up. Yeah, well, it made, it's made me think from time to time. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah probably, probably yeah. I should keep stum now. Yeah. yeah, every now and then, every now every and, now and, then. and but, then. But not for I'll this podcast. It. It's not really good, yeah. good in journalism, no. dead air. I'll tell you what your favourite, well, one of your favourite football journalists, David Lacey, said in uh, the Guardian newspaper the day after. So this was the 14th of October. Um he says, uh, it's quite telling actually, he says, Graham Taylor's grey confederacy of a team ended up well beaten in a raucous, rejoicing Feyenoord stadium here last night. As a result, their chances of qualifying have been reduced to a uh, hope now so distant that it practically becomes infinity. Two goals in the space of eight minutes in the second half from Ronnie Koeman, who scored with a retaken free kick. That was another joke of a, you know, um, and... I suppose Graham Taylor has to take the blame for that, for uh, using um, Paul um, Paul Ince as the person that attacks the free kicks. And he went off too early, gave Koeman a second shot at it. I'll tell you what was great about the commentary to the second, the retake of the Ronald Koeman free kick. So the first free kick, he went for strength. He went for power. He blasted it, as you know, Ronald mm -hmm. Koeman would. And Paul Gask, no, it's not just Paul Lintz, it's one other player. It might have been Tony Adams. Anyway, they rushed towards the ball. As almost... the Dutch had done at the other end yes. with, with our free kick and got away with it, you know. But I said the ref made mistakes here. Yeah. But the, the point I'm making, if they were confident about that defence, they should have waited for, you know, at least... Ronald Koeman's toe to touch the ball before they rushed forward, or just before that, maybe they'd have gotten away with it, but they rushed forward too early. And it wasn't mm -hmm. Paul Lintz that rushed forward first, it was the other England player. But the second, the retake of the free kick, you can hear Brian Coleman's commentary saying, Brian Moore, Brian Moore. Oh, was it? Yeah. Sorry, Brian, yeah. Brian Coleman, <laughs> David Coleman, Brian, Brian Moore's commentary saying, He's going to oh, flick one. He's, he's going to flick one. It. Yeah, it's he's brilliant, flick it. isn't it? He's going to flick it. He's going to flick it. So he knows what Ronald Koeman is going to do. Why don't yeah. the England? Is a particularly David Seaman in goal who leaves literally 90% of the goal for he, he's, he's way too much far over, isn't he? He's mad. way, way too it's far complete over. Complete madness. Uh, if if that was due to the coach, then uh, you're right, Graham Taylor has a lot to answer for. But anyway, th this is what uh, David Lacey says. He says, um, so uh and Ronald Koeman scores with a retaken free kick and Burkamp, who found the net with a softish shot soon after Seaman had made a marvellous double save to keep England in the match, have left uh, Taylor's players to contemplate some fanciful arithmetic. That that Bergman, Bergman uh, shot, it may have seemed softish, but that was proper thinking football fan. No, no, I was an England fan. This would have been around the time when I was starting to be aware of football. My big kind of football awakening was the 94 World Cup. So maybe this was a few months too early because um it was i was i was it was it was a great shock to eight-year-old me 
a few months later to discover that England weren't going to be at the World Cup. But actually, in a way, I think that was quite, quite important for my football education because it was like there was no, you know, England fans have no right to demand their team to be at a major tournament. And also it meant my first tournament wasn't, I wasn't obsessed by how England were going to do. I got that kind of two the years same later. Way. I feel the same way about my first World Cup, 74. Uh, it, it, also, it, it stops you getting all nervous about it. You can just kind of enjoy it without waking up and thinking, oh, we're going to get humiliated today, you know. Unfortunately for us Nigerian fans, we did make 94. I was in the States at the time. Uh, it took me a long, 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 long time in the States to find a Nigerian football shirt. But I think I found one. I can't remember which airport it was. And I just snapped it up straight away. And I was nervous throughout. I was nervous throughout. And I had every right to be nervous because wasn't that the World Cup that Argentina humiliated us again with the same old oh, trick? To... Beat. It was difficult. It was, a, it was, it was Maradona's last game. And okay. he was great. Mm. He was great, and he, he had to be because that was a good Nigeria Nigeria side with a little bit more game smarts and more help from the referee who didn't sell, send off Maldini for a disgraceful last man <laughs> tackle that anyone else in the world would have been sent off for. Nigeria would, would have would have made it through. Well, it's always the Argentinas that knock us out of the World Cup. And and Mark, uh, just testing your seven year old uh, political now. Do you remember who pr the prime minister was at the time? Uh, John Major. Oh, wow. Did you know that from when you were seven years old? Or did you yeah. have to look that up in a dictionary afterwards? Or No, I, I, I knew that. I was a bit, uh, wow. when I was a kid, How I was slightly obsessed by politics for, for, for some reason. How Honestly, can anyone be slightly obsessed with John Major? This is a good question. <laughs> well, it wasn't necessarily John Major, he but is, what you... He is Graham Taylor managing the country, <laughs> isn't he? The grey confederacy of John Major. <laughs> I saw that coming only like seconds before you dropped it. <laughs> I saw I, the grey confederacy making a, a, a return, you know. <laughs> I, I think I in, my, in my defence... wake up with the old pyjamas wet through as well. You know, I can imagine oi, it. Oi. Leave <laughs> Miss Edwina Curry out of this, please. <laughs> um, sorry, in my defence, I think that that time of that that era was quite an exciting time for the world, wasn't it? There was a lot going on. Um, my my parents were overjoyed that only I think about eighteen months before this, Nelson Mandela had been not just free, but it, it was quite obvious at this point that he was going to go on and have a career in, in politics and, you know, bring apartheid was being dismantled in front of us. Um, it's about three years before this, but, you know, you're only seven years old. I was only seven, months. yeah. 18 months feels like three years in those days, doesn't it? When you're Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, like, I just, you know, I looked at the charts before, the, before we started recording the show and I, I just think it was an exciting time for music as well. Please explain, explain. Uh, well, what do you like? Whether or not you appreciate the music of Take That, who are number one at this point, Gary Barlow is probably one of the great songwriters in that that Britain's produced. Um, I mean, obviously he's not for everyone, but he is, you know, he is up there with in terms of his how prolific he's been. And then the other thing I find really fascinating about him is that he kind of, you know, take that in their prime in the early 90s, then they go away for about 10 years and they come back and become the biggest band in Britain ever again as as grown men, which for me is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, uh, they managed to do that. I'm not sure if they should have come back, but there you go. Um, no, no, because there's two different bands almost, isn't it? Uh, it's a very different band. They can't quite do the teeny bop or the weeny bop things that they did afterwards. And I think you've got a point about Gary Barlow. I, I, I will second that. You know, perhaps there ain't a huge amount of competition with the greatest ever British song of writers. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny, but, you know, if you look at it, it's probably sort of the Americans that hold the sway in terms of pop and rock music of great songwriters. But that aside, uh, number two in the charts, uh, so Relight My Fire by Take That featuring Lulu, poor old Lulu, poor old Lulu. Her career should have been way above uh, Take That all time, all day long, and yet it's Take That featuring Lulu rather than the other way around. But at number two, Meatloaf's I Do Anything For Love, but I won't Have do Have you that. ever met anyone who likes Meatloaf? Um, I met him at Radio 2. Would have been... Did you call him Mr. Loaf? 
No, I didn't because he was going by his uh, full name at that time. And mm. I can't remember what it was. And I think I avoided calling him by a name. But it was last time I saw B Barbara Windsor, funnily enough, and the dementia had obviously started setting in there because all the photographers outside the building were there to see Meatloaf, who had been a bit ill, so didn't look like himself, lost a lot of weight, you know, didn't have all the long hair and everything like that. And Barbara Windsor was coming out of uh, Radio 2, I think it was, and um, she thought all the photographers were there for her. And she was like nervous, she's saying, what should I do, what should I do? And I had to sort of like be her support. And I said, don't worry about it. You know, they're not here for you. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about was, it, everyone's but, forgotten but you. She was panicking, nice. no, I didn't quite say that. I'm not like that. Anyway, I do anything for love, but I won't do that is a song that everybody loved, even you, Tim, come on. No, you? no, I've never liked anything. that <laughs> I, I've just never met anyone who likes who likes him? Who likes this? Hang stuff? on, Mark. Mark. I don't. I don't like yeah, Mark's it. Mark's like, mum probably likes it. I, I, I'm not. No, my mum. It's my mum doesn't look like like his personality in general. I don't think. I mean, it's a bit too kind of out there for my mum. But I remember this song being on top of the pops around. It would have been obviously around this time. I remember watching the video, being absolutely captivated by it because it was really dramatic. And nice. there, you know, he was in a castle or something, I believe. I think it was kind of a take on Beauty wasn't and the it? Beast, right? It was. That I was about to say that. Yeah, it was Beauty yeah. and the Beast, wasn't it? Yeah, Screaming Jay Hawkins did it all so much better decades ago. He did a different thing, though. He didn't do the same as Meatloaf, because to be mm -hmm. fair to Meatloaf, and Screaming Jay Hawkins, I love Screaming Jay Hawkins. I put a spell on you! But uh, what Meatloaf did was... Uh, carve a unique space for himself in a sort of very, very, very crowded musical uh, landscape. For example, uh, can you think of any other artist, rock artist, that has brought in rock stroke pop artist that has brought in opera, the drama yeah, of Queen? Opera? Yeah, yeah, it was Queen's whole shtick. Okay, but Meatloaf did it his way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for ruining yeah. my train of thought there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to I'm going to save you now by saying that if I think about this time and look at the charts, yeah. and there's nothing by the, I'm obsessed with the two unlimited. I don't know why. I never yeah, want to listen to them. I think I had a thing about the woman, yeah. um, but that kind of Euro Euro techno Euro disco, you know, horrible thumpity thumpity thump yeah. Yeah. music for people who who have no sense of rhythm. There's loads of that around, isn't it? That 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 kind well, of uh, we allowed it to happen. We oh, allowed yes, it to happen, yes. just like we allowed the Netherlands to beat us in this. Had the way, you remember? Had the way. Well, the ladies. It's one for the ladies. That isn't it? <laughs> nonsense. Complete and utter nonsense. Uh, having said that, you've got a remake of Frankie Goes to Hollywood there, uh, Relax. Uh, you've also got, and don't knock the Pet Shop Boys because my missus toured with them with Go West. And please don't knock M people who are... No, I won't, I won't knock it. it. It's the one that stands out. That, because no. my missus is on the back in vocals of that, you know that? All oh, right. Moving right. on up. Of course she is. Uh -huh. yeah, she's on every single M People song. She's doing the backing vocals on that, her and Juliet Roberts. But my missus tended to be the one that... Um, that uh, what do you want to call it? You know, the, uh, constructed the backing vocals, as it were, mm -hmm. um, um, arranged them, arranged them. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> At Chakademus and Pliers, soft pop reggae. By then, unfortunately, they'd gone that way because they'd had that hit with "Tease mm -hmm. Me, Tease Me, Tease Me Till I Lose Control." Tease mm -hmm. Me. Which was a great little reggae dance hall tune, but it got into the charts. You know, once you see all the money, suddenly the, the your, yeah. your income goes up sort of like fifty fold. It's hard like to it resist that temptation, isn't of it? Of course. Let's just do another one like that. Yeah. It's ironic though that with a lot of pop artists, you wonder why they just don't do the same thing again. You know, a lot of pop artists was there, oh no, I've done that and I'm gonna do something completely different. And their careers just go, you know, crash. Well, perhaps because they are artists. They want to. They don't want to express what they yeah, were expressing but, last week. But you see, that is a a very European uh, or privileged European point of view on this. The Jamaican. Well, have a word with that about Miles Davis. 
Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's the definition of not doing today what he you're, did yesterday. You're determined to wipe the floor with me. Too. What am I saying? I'm just well, trying to shout I, out. I'm not going to stop me. until yeah. you are like Graham Taylor saying, <laughs> I wake up with the usual pyjamas. I am wet crying. Cream. <laughs> I'm crying. Sleeping in pyjamas, crying no, out loud. No, I know. But Jack, and Dean, the, what I was going to say, Mark, and, you know, I don't know if your generation wouldn't have known about the heyday of reggae. So 93 is sort of like possibly 12 years or so after the yeah. heyday of reggae, as it were. So for you, you're hearing reggae for the first time with she don't let nobody, she don't let, and you think that's reggae, don't you? Yeah, I I, I think that that's probably you're right. So the kind of reggae that was about that we were hearing on the radio back then was kind of quite soft. Even people like Aswood and would, would have kind of toned it down a little bit at that point as well, hadn't they? They had, they had. Well, and their their problem was that they had that hit with that "Don't Turn Around." Yeah. Yeah. You see, up until then, they were hardcore reggae, and Brinsley Ford was the main singer. Brinsley Dan, as he was calling himself at the time, Twelve Tribes of Israel. But then what happened was um, the softer vocalist of Aswad was the drummer, Drummy. Drummy Zeb, and he got the hit with Don't Turn Around. And obviously the record company thought, let's have more of this. Mm. So Brinsley Ford got relegated um, to second lead vocalist, which was just a tragedy. I mean, yeah. first of all, he, was, he was the main one, wouldn't he? He, oh, was, uh, he, was, he was great. I love Drummy stuff as a little interlude. Yep. That's and then how we get, it was. Let, yeah, and then we get back to, to, to what it was. That's exactly how it was. Like Tupac said to Biggie, um, oh, I can't use the word that Tupac, uh, I can't use the word that Tupac uses. But basically, Tupac told Biggie, look, make the tunes for the ladies. And that's the, <laughs> that's the juxtaposition <laughs> of what the word he said. <laughs> but um, make the tunes for the ladies because they're the ones that buy the records. And what Aswad cleverly was doing, Roots Reggae was a very sort of male-oriented thing, but Lovers, of course, was a very female-oriented thing. What Aswad were doing was putting in a tune like Roots Rocking, which was a massive hit on a 12 it's Gorgeous. It's it gorgeous. was beautiful, wasn't it? They yeah. put that in, in between all the hardcore reggae they'd have roots rocking oh no get to let the music play that's that's quite good that's that's, that's <laughs> the best i've ever heard you sing no, i'm not sure about that i'm not yeah. sure about good but you know the point i'm making mm. about it is they, it's they a low had, bar they had the perfect formula though didn't they they had to, yeah. you know, always do, do some hardcore for the fellas but do some soft tunes for the ladies. So what you see at your concert are ladies waiting for Drummy to do his little soft thing. But by the time they get into the charts here, what, what are they in the charts with? Uh, it's a soppy little tune. I can't even remember it, to be honest. But it's, um, oh gosh, where are they in the charts? Uh, are they low down in the charts? I mean, where is Aswad in the charts? Can't I'm not sure. I just, I just mentioned them because they, you know, they were kind of in the ether at that time. I'm not, they might not have even been there. Yeah, no, they were definitely in the charts at the time. They had some, like, soppy little tune. I can't even remember what it was. But um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. The other group, reggae group, that you probably thought was a real reggae group was UB40. You were in the charts somewhere down there as well. Uh, did you take them to be reggae for you? I, oh, I, Dance Hall Mood was the as word at number 55. Dance I Hall. always consider UB40 to be, like, training reggae, isn't it? It's like, if you never heard it before, listen to this. And if you like it, then go a bit deeper into it. I think that's a good analysis. What do you reckon, Tim? Yeah, and I loved their early years. I think they were, they were heavier than that early years. They were, I, I they think were more dub. Uh, I think the, 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 those first few years, first five or six years are, are, are terrific. And maybe in the same way, I don't know, with like pressures the record company, Red Red Wine kind of kind of ruined them, didn't it? It made them a, like a kind of karaoke reggae group. How, how much, when, when we're talking about these kind of almost karaoke reggae songs, how much of an influence was, you know, people like Madonna and Blondie kind of using reggae vibes in some of their tracks? Did that kind of push people towards this style? Or... Tim, do you want to take that? Well, I think it's it's your field. Um... I don't think Madonna and these, like, uh, the pop artists themselves, um, I don't think it was related to what, was coming out of let's say Jamaica and even in the UK sort of reggae scene in the UK at the time I don't think they pushed people in that direction I think it was like uh, Tim said a moment ago with uh, 
Tim said a moment ago with Red Red Wine of uh, UB40, I think actually it's the record companies that were designing this. See, af after the heyday of reggae, which would have been, you know, m maybe the highlight of the, the heyday, just like 1957 was the heyday of rock and roll, 50s rock and roll. The heyday of uh, reggae was probably 1980, just before Bob Marley died. Uh, and reggae was becoming mainstream to a certain extent, the odd tune was getting into the charts, etc., without diluting the essence of uh, reggae. You know, Silly Games is not like a tune that's been diluted at all. That is UK lover's rock at its pinnacle, and it's still, and uh, I know this because I know Janet Kaye very well, and she performs my missus regularly, it is still the one UK reggae tune that fans of lover's rock, I don't care who you are, lover's rock, still jump up with delight at hearing. So they didn't t tone it down one little bit. The heavy bass is still there. All the sort of reggae chops are still there. They haven't they haven't pandered to the pop taste. But by the time you get to Aswad in particular for me, uh, because I followed them so much beforehand, and by the time you start getting into the later aspect of UB40, then you're hearing record companies just say, look, just do a pop tune and put a little bit of ka-ching, 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 at the end of it, and you know, you'll feel all right. And I can't blame these artists, like I was trying to say about Chakademus and Plyas before Tim rudely interrupted me and wiped the floor with me <laughs> and talked about Miles Davis. Look, when you come from, I'll tell you a funny anecdote. I'll tell you a funny anecdote. I'm not gonna mention the name of the person's concerned now because it's not fair. I thought about that. I said it on air once and I regretted it. And I thought, you know, why are you sort of like exposing these people on air? But there was a scenario, if you can imagine yourself, Aswad and UB40, both playing in Paris. They end up going to a restaurant, you know, not together, but they end up being at a restaurant um, ser serendipitously at the same time. And remember, some of the members, the um, the outer or the periphery members uh, is specifically the horn players, the horn players who are two brothers, they were uh, playing, they had been Aswad's horn section and now UB40 said, you know, come on over here, we want you to play horns for us. So they'd gone over and obviously UB40 with the bigger band, still are the bigger band. <clears throat> and, uh, and I know the two brothers very well, by the way, but uh, basically I heard this story which just left me in hysterics but it's actually quite sad because Aswad and UB40 hated each other for whatever reason didn't get on hated each other and there was a scene where the horn players are now sitting over with their Aswad friends so they're they're, they're on tour with UB40 but they're sitting over with the Aswad boys you know um and you know chatting away and then UB40 turned around to them and said oh you two come over here we're the ones paying your wages and they had to come over and you look at that and you just think to yourself well this is what was going on at the time that they were competing um for the the band that earned the most money you know the the the, 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 the bigger band there was a little bit of rivalry with I, I get depressed by those stories because I, I want to you know, imagine them I want to imagine them as as brothers in arms Pushing the same, pushing the same kind of agenda. It's wrong no. group, mate. Bro brothers in arms. Yeah, so. I know, I know. you know, but th that's the way. I, I want to imagine because oh, I want to admire all these people who are making music that that we like. I want to imagine them thinking, all right, they're competing with each other, but in mutual respect. Uh, when it gets nasty and competitive, uh, that 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 story le leaves me feeling a little bit depressed. Sorry to have uh, depressed you in that respect. No, no, I genuinely am. I, I don't think, like I said, I've thought about the story before as well. And it's not one that uh, is covered in glory in any way. And um, I, I, I do get what you're saying, actually. Um, uh, but then again, you know, if this was uh, um, uh, the Graham Taylor uh, and you know, a little bit of his, the way that he treats the press, um, particularly when he humiliates a member of the press, leaves me very cold as well no his dad his dad did what? his dad was a sports journal graham taylor's dad yeah yeah that's how he first got into it right at the start uh, and uh, part of that bitterness i think you're seeing there was that he thought he was going to get a fair run from him because you know i'm one of you and so on and, and uh, when they started sniping at him i think he was a little bit thin-skinned because of that 
that uh, he thought he was being turned on by people who were who were his own. So it's it's there's a similarity between the Aswad UB40 story, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I actually think you're actually right to make that comparison. You know, uh, I mean, um, if it was Karai Lanus who had been making the comparison with perhaps a better comparison than UB40 <laughs> for uh, Graham Taylor, he, he would have said, "What's the matter, you dissentious rogues <laughs> that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? That's what you lot do, scabs." That's more or less what uh, Graham Taylor said to the press when they were basically asking him and saying that they were worried that England was going to... That's strange, because I thought he just said, Rob, Rob, (laughs) Rob. It's much more eloquent when you do it. (laughs) Well, I have a sort of a Shakespearean bent about me. Anyway, still going back to the charts. You really are on form today. Uh, Going back to the charts. Uh, I'm sure your generation, Mark, would have loved to have seen or were happy to see Cypress Hill there. when the shit goes down, whenever I see that, I think, because they went there at number 36 on this day, October the 13th, uh, 1993, but they'd come down from 21. So someone would have had to read the charts, you know, thing on Radio 1 at some point. I wonder how they read that title. It sent them insane in the brain, surely. Yeah, but that's (laughs) that's easier. But, you know, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, Alan Freeman soon, and at number 21, Cypress Hill with When the Bleak Goes Down. (laughs) (laughs) So so around this time, my uh, mum's younger brother was living with us. And he must have been probably between about 16 and 18. And I think he was at college at the time. And he'd have to come pick me and my little sister up from school to, and keep, keep look after us till my parents got back. And every afternoon, he'd pick us up, he'd come home, would make make us something to eat, and he'd let us listen to... Well, he'd just put on Cypress Hill, and me and my sister would I just loved it. absorb yeah. it. But and my mum would come home absolutely raging that <laughs> her two children... all these new words. <laughs> learned, yeah. <laughs> And also singing, um, this is something you can't understand. How I could just kill a man. <laughs> this pig went to, this pig did this, this pig did that. Oh, that was a, it was a good track, good track. They were great at the time, but they were like, they were hailing in a new era of, um, of uh, rap music, which was kind of, it was gangster, but it was, kind of um first of all there was a latin connection to it which we hadn't seen in rap at least we hadn't seen blow up as big as send dog of um of uh cypress hill managed to wave the flag for mexicans and everybody else or cubans were they cubans or i can't even remember. i think they're mexican isn't it because it's that mexican? short old culture thing isn't it yeah what was dj muggs mexican or or was he more cuban i'm not i'm not sure well, but they're, I think... they're from Cali, so it would probably be Mexican, yeah. but, uh, certainly. But then this mix of black and Latino, um, I think, was uh, unique. And they just brought a different sort of twist to the gangster, you know, kind of cleverer twist to it, a little bit more humour to gangster rap. Uh, gangster rap always had humour, always had humour about it. But I think, it, you know, when uh, NWA, for example, about uh, talking about, you know, killing this person and killing that person, killing, you can't see the humour so much. Whereas uh, Cypress Hill just made it funny, just made it funny. Uh, Bitty McLean, a great little track, It Keeps Raining, Tears From My Eyes. Uh, Bitty McLean, young reggae guy out of Birmingham. And again, he had a voice for pop, but he was proper reggae, to be fair to Bitty McLean. Us Three, and that was at number 35, and uh, number 34, Cantaloupe, featuring Rashan uh, by Us Three. I, I, I knew one of the saxophonists with Us Three, going out with uh, um, a woman that I knew, um, a friend of um, my girlfriend at the time. And they were they were really interesting sort of jazz group us three being a great name for three players uh they're a really interesting jazz group out of the uk that just i don't think they, they never managed to match cantaloupe which of course is a cover as well wasn't their original track salt and pepper in the charts two-tone uh uh or the two-tone ep specials and uh, special aka madness selected the beat Number 30, you've got Belinda Carlisle in there. You've got Blur in there, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, you've got a pretty decent chart, Tim. I don't know what you're complaining about. Well, this, of all of this stuff, is there anything that 
really stands a test. I mean, there's uh, Dream Lover, Mariah, which for me is her, is her first wonderful track. I love it. I love that ethereal quality to it. Mm, mm. Um, apart from that, it just seems to be clogged up with like Euro, Euro pap. Mm, mm. I, I think there's a lot of tracks in there that are quite, quite anthemic. Even that, you know, that meatloaf track and the take that track, which are at the top of the charts. I mean, you'd probably hear them being sung on a Saturday night, even now. Well, obviously not in COVID, but, you know, out with COVID in, in the in the bars and pubs around up and down this country, I'd imagine. Is, think... is, is there anything there? Because I always think that the, the best music, when you mentioned two-tone there, I mean, two-tone, it, when it was, you know, in 79, it was a movement. Mm. And the, the, the best so often I think is, is connected to some kind of movement. Is there any movement going on here? Do you, is there anything? Do, I was gonna say, do you think that this is more a, a representative of, of the time when it's kind of the end of kind of yuppies eighties culture and the beginning of kind of, you know, into the nineties and well, obviously we're a few years away from the kind of massive internet boom, but people being, I suppose, slightly more kind of chilled out and not as, as hectic as the eighties was and p people that generation starting to settle down a little bit maybe and the younger generation coming through it's, and, it seems to me like it, it, it's like waiting for the great leap forward and the great leap forward i suppose was brit pop a couple of years I think later you have a point uh, well blur already in the charts here so i think brit pop has started at this point in 93 uh, perhaps it hasn't been formulated as such but i think you asked the right question tim how, how which of these stand the test of time I think there are two songs in the charts that stand the test of time. And um, I'll come back on to why I think that is in a moment, but Creep by Radiohead has stood the test of time. If we're talking about, you know, 27, 28 years later, that is still um, the, the iconic tune by Radiohead. And also Moving On Up by M People, not just because my missus is on it, but that you can hear any day of the week on you know these sort of um, you know pop stations that play old tunes and everything like that it has stood the test of time and it it stands for something it's iconic in terms of you know a positive tune that people refer to those are the two tunes i would say in the entire charts that have stood the test of time the meatloaf funny enough what you said mark um i do anything for love but i won't do that you still do hear it but arguably the tune of his that stood the test or that stands the test of time more than that is um, Bat Out of Hell. And that has got the movement that Tim was talking about there of headbangers who, as soon as they play that, you just see the old headbangers, their hair slightly more bald on top now, but still got the long hair though, and a little bit of gray to it as well. Um, coming out, you know, like a Bat Out of Hell, as it were. But the really interesting thing about the charts, look at how many reissues that there are. It's yeah. mad. So you've Point. got... Frankie goes to Hollywood with a reissue of Relax at number eight, Relax 1993. They've actually got to put in parentheses with all of these, this is the 1993 remix. Diana Ross at number 20 with a remix of Chain Reaction, 1993 again uh, there. And um, if you go further down, what do you see? You see, couple more like that in the charts living on my own freddie mercury uh freddie mercury a, a rehash of his uh, original living on my own um and what else there's at least one more oh yeah moonlight shadow mike oldfield you know mm. it's like 20 years later or whatever uh moonlight shadow is being reissued uh at number 70 and it can be reissued every year and it'll still get into the charts because it's one of those classics. So basically what the charts is saying to you is that like they said in that Slade tune, Merry Christmas, everybody, the old tunes are the best ones. Or maybe it's a grey confederacy for a grey era. I think on that note, we'll end this Brazilian shirt name mm -hmm. podcast. Mark, thanks very much, Tim. Thanks for wiping the floor with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK.